Cool. Thanks, everyone, for joining this afternoon, where we're going to be chatting all about how to measure the ROI of content, which has been quite a requested topic. Um, we're joined by a range of panellists today. We've got Dominic Kent on the freelance side, um, he's a content marketer in the unified comms industry. We've got Hiba Amin, who is on the in-house side. She manages demand gen at Testbox. And then we have Araminta Robertson on the content agency side. She's the founder of Mint Studios, a content agency for fintechs. So good range of panelists to dive into this topic today. In terms of the format, I've got a bunch of pre-submitted questions on my own. If you've got any, just pop them into the Q&A box and we'll run through those as we go as well. And let's hand over to our panelists to introduce themselves. So I'll start with you, Araminta. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Arminta and I run Mint Studios. We help fintech companies turn their blogs into a customer acquisition channel. Awesome. And I also run a fintech marketing Slack group and, and host events a bit like, like these online and in person, I guess that's the other thing to say. Amazing. So I just noticed a message. Thanks, Jude, that apparently no one's been able to speak in the chat. So I've just adjusted something. Hopefully... Mm. You can all now say hello. Dominic, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, and I'm kind of freelance in-house and kind of have my own agency. In I'm going through a bit of an identity crisis, but I work with unified comms companies, which are people like Cisco, RingCentral, Zoom, Microsoft, Slack, those kind of folks on demand gen, content marketing, all the way through the funnel, hate email marketing. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Old. And Hiba? Yeah, I'm Hiba. I have worked at tech companies my entire career. I think my biggest stint was in product-led growth. I've just gotten into the marketplace space, which is a whole new rabbit hole. I really love templates as a form of driving engagement and leads and or signups and revenue. And yeah, I think that's that's a good synopsis for now. <laughs> nice. Templates. That's a very niche response to that. I'm interested to find out more about that. Cool. Thanks for introducing yourselves. And okay, let's kick off with the first questions here. So uh, measuring the ROI of content, why should or shouldn't you be measuring the ROI of content? Dom, let's start with you. I think the should we do why shouldn't you first? Because I think that's the more interesting one for me mm. personally. I think yeah. Let's let's not measure ROI if you may be exposed that content isn't the right thing to be working on and you happen to be a content marketer. So maybe as a freelancer and my first five blog posts haven't performed for my client, I probably wouldn't want to show them that just yet. I would want to say, hold on, let's not do an ROI exercise just yet. Let's let's keep doing what we doing what I know has worked for other customers before and give it some time. That's probably the only the only reason I can think of why I wouldn't want to do an ROI exercise with anybody. Why why should you? As I guess as an employee or in-house, you you prove that you're good at your job, right? You'll prove that you're worth keeping. So if you cost a business fifty thousand pounds a year and the return through your content marketing function is two hundred and fifty thousand pounds a year, then it's quite obvious that you're you're doing your content marketing job very well and it's very hard to fire you. Same as a freelancer, I guess. If you're spending 10 grand a month on a freelancer, that freelancer needs to be contributing at least 10 grand a month to your revenue, maybe not per month, but over time, as long as you're securing that £100,000 worth of revenue per year, it's worth retaining that freelancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent case there for both why you should and maybe shouldn't at times uh, be measuring ROI. And Hiro, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think on the should side, beyond obviously, you know, justifying your job and your salary, I think it helps you make better decisions for the business. So I've historically been a marketing team of one for a good chunk of my career, and it helps me make sure that when I'm kind of making a case to the CEO, hopefully you can't hear what's going on outside, but it's easier to make a case to the CEO and say, hey, you have 30 phenomenal great ideas. Looking at the numbers, this doesn't make sense. A, I don't have time to do everything, but B, here's the best return for our efforts. And so I think it helps you as a marketer just really prioritize your time overall. And even within content specifically, it helps you prioritize your time within a specific content type, 
category of content like or format let's say and even let's say distribution beyond that i think on the shouldn't is if you don't have good metrics to track like if you're focusing on all of the right thing the wrong things don't measure content because it's going to lead you down the wrong path yeah that makes sense yeah great point about using the information to make different decisions about which content you're going to be using did you have any additional points Araminta, on I mean, I, I agree with everything that's been said. I think, so it's interesting because during Brighton SEO, we had the CMO of Hrefs do a very interesting speech where he said that you can't measure the ROI of content. So it'd be really cool to have him on this call and see his perspective. But his reasoning was basically, you just can't measure it because there's too many variables. So we all here would agree that, you know, content helps build trust. You can't, you know, the con uh, the customer journey isn't like a straight line. There's so many things that happen and that's not measurable. And I don't disagree with him. And and sure, it's, it's not very accurate, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't measure. And so my reasoning behind it is that, look, I work in the fintech industry, finance and technology, and I think it's similar to the United Comms and, and also tech for Hiba in that, we are like the leadership team or the founders are technical people. They're not marketers. And, you know, if you, you're a marketing tool that sells to other marketers like Ahrefs is, it's, it's very easy to justify to your higher ups that, that, you know, you can't track the ROI of content. And that's what he said in his talk. And I'm literally quoting was place bets and use common sense. But I can't do that. I can't go to, you know, a fintech leader to a CTO or to a technical person and say, we're just going to place bets. They need to see numbers. They need to see an ROI. They need to understand, you know, if we're going to spend 5K, 10K, what can we expect? And so really at the end of the day, it's, it's for communication purposes. If the leaders, especially now with market conditions and an economic downturn, they're going to want to see even more profitability or ROI. And so it's just better to work with them rather than against them. And then just to, to agree with what everyone else said, it just helps make a case for, uh, it, it might be the difference between keeping your job and not. It might be the difference between, you know, having the same marketing budget or having a smaller one. So it just it's just for communication purposes and it just helps a lot more when you're trying to get something done. That's what I would say. Yeah, great point. It just makes your job so much easier because like, those technical founders are going to want that information, whether you like it or not. So it makes it so much easier if you have it there. It's especially the case if you're VC backed as well. Like I work with a lot of startups and often I'm the, second marketing hire or marketing person i guess and they need to know where's their money going to go right yeah um, so the ceo will be tasked with presenting a budget for the next 6 12 18 36 months and they need to know not just where that's going but also what is the expected return on my investment right and i think araminta started to talk about the intangible stuff which i know is coming up later so i think I'll stop talking. I won't ruin it. <laughs> so brilliant points there for like why it's so important to be measuring content. But if somebody is perhaps the only marketer in their team or their company hasn't done much measuring yet, where should somebody start if they need to start measuring the ROI of content completely from scratch? Dom. So I've done this with Mio, right? We've grown from... When I joined, I think it was maybe 10 people and one marketer. So I was the second marketing hire. That marketer then went on to be UX. So I became the only person. So it became important for me to justify my position as a part-time freelance and for a bit full-time marketer. Why should you keep me? So I had to do the arduous job of trying to go back in time and link up all the Google Analytics and try and work out that actually these 400,000 blog views equate to about a million dollars. And that maybe took me, I don't know, two weeks to do all of that and get all the old data, which while I was doing that, I wasn't creating content, wasn't distributing content. There was the output was missing for those two weeks. So if I'd have done that from day one, I would have been able to continue contributing, continue growing the business at a vital stage. The first six months, I guess, of a startup's live content marketing program are probably the most important, right? You need to prove that content marketing is going to work pretty early on. You need some traction. You need to be able to display it. Otherwise, it's pure trust in what you're saying. And at the time, five years ago, I didn't have any other case studies that actually, yeah, if you leave it 18 months, you'll get these results like my customer A, B, and C. It was more, 
you're my experiment customer and I need to make this work. So I think that's probably why you should begin very early. The how is probably you need to know the basics around which content is performing and by performing, not just traffic, obviously by conversions, do those conversions turn into just freemium subscribers or are they paying customers? And I think there's probably a, an exercise you can do, which is visitors to leads to paid customers to demonstrate that it is working. Um, you either do that manually or if you set up your analytics from the very beginning, you you can make it automated and a lot easier to track. And are there any tools that you recommend newbies begin with to start measuring these things? I think the best ones are more, they're very expensive, right? Like active campaign is probably not suggested for a startup. Same with HubSpot. They're expensive. They are better for enterprise marketing teams, I would say, but they do the job very, very well. The argument again is the ROI on those tools. Are you going to use all the features? Is it worth paying hundreds of pounds per month for those licenses? Or could you actually figure it out in a couple of spreadsheets or some Zapier integrations or whatever it might be. Google Analytics is a must. Google Search Console is a must. Integrating the two together is very, very helpful. Further on from that, I'm sure the answer is yes, there are some more tools, but I'll probably back away at this point. <laughs> nice. Good good roundup there, Don. Thank you. And Araminta, do you have anything to add in terms of how to go about measuring content, just starting from scratch? I think, yeah, I think what Dom said is a good place to start. I would, I found often, I mean, because we're external, it it's often, it takes a while to get access to the right tools to get it all set up. So if you want to start immediately, I'd start with tracking clicks. It's not, you know, the best, it's not most accurate, but it's a good place to start. And so we use a Google Tag Manager. And what's great with Google Tag Manager is you can literally track anything that's happening on a website. You can track form submissions. You can track everything else as well, but sometimes you need a bit more like expertise to know how to do that. But I would, I would, if you can get really good at Google Tag Manager, because then you will never have to worry about getting access to certain tools. You can just use Google Tag Manager to track everything. Start with clicks. Then if you can, form submissions, create an account. Another tool that you know, if you're a product, if you sell products, then something like Mixpanel or another product management tool can also be really helpful. And if you can, HubSpot, like the level of detail is just, it's just a game changer with HubSpot because you can literally see what blogs they read, right? A lead, you can see how valuable that lead was because the, although I, what you said, Dom, makes, makes sense is a good approach, but it's very hard to attribute like the quality of a lead, right? So imagine you've got a lead that came in and that's worth 10K and you've got another one that came in and it's like 3K with HubSpot, you can tell which blog post that 10K one read. And with that information, you can be like, oh, wow, this blog generated really high quality leads. We should do more of those. And that's like, that's incredible information. And I think only HubSpot could really do that. I think nothing else really, maybe active campaign, but. Yeah, yeah. HubSpot is amazing for that visibility. And it's just, once it's all set up, it's so smooth and easy to click around and see all the data. That's yeah. a little bit of a chore in itself, though, isn't it? The once it's all set up. If you've yeah. never used it before, casually once it's set up. If you've never used yeah. it before, hire someone that has. Yeah. Exactly. Hire. I would hire someone. Yeah. Good tip. Oh, Dom also recommended, I think he sent it to just the panelists here, but recommend. I can, I can only send oh, chats to, to us, which is. If you, where it says two, it's there should right. be a drop down in blue. I need yeah, to be... it ain't there. No? Okay. Okay. Um, but yeah, well... Hotjar, hot because um, then you can see where pe... Hotjar is probably best used on landing pages because then you can see where people are clicking or more importantly aren't clicking so they get halfway down your page close go away but also on your content be it an infographic a blog whatever it is you can see where people are leaving the page and that's really important like it might say that your intros suck because no one reads further than your first three lines it might be actually lose people halfway down the page and if you've only got a call to action to go to your landing page download your product fill out a form at the bottom whack one at the top because people only read 50% of your blog or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hotjar makes it so clear as to people really don't read much further than the top half quite often. I think you get 60 days free as well still, which is nice. 60 days worth of data is better than none. Yeah. Good, good tip. And Hiba, what are your thoughts on Western what someone should start when it comes to measuring the ROI of content? Yeah, I think it, I, 
I think it's tricky because I'm going through it right now as being basically the first marketer, first marketing hire. I am not the first person to say I'm great at marketing ops by any means, including setting up things like Google Tag Manager and um, the surprise of GA4, which has just completely mm -hmm. thrown me for a loop. I feel lost. <laughs> I still feel lost within tools that I think were critical to how I made decisions at my last company. I think if you end up being one of the first hires on a team is just even selling content is the first step i've done that mm. i think i've done an okay job of that so far just based on my own experience to say here's what's worked at my not only my past company but companies that are similar to ours so here's potentially some metrics or like north stars we can try and achieve so from a marketplace perspective test box zapier zapier that's a product that I think a lot of people look at from a content perspective, just because they've been able to scale so fast, both in their creation, but also just across search and really, really drive a good chunk of distribution and relevant traffic to their website that converts. Um, and so I think just identifying what's most important to your business and what the goals are company-wide and seeing if it makes sense to have content mapped into that and for us for the last eight months it didn't necessarily not to the extent that i would have wanted because we are so focused on building and testing short-term experiments basically across a bunch of different channels we're starting from scratch we don't know what works and so content and especially when you're starting is not going to operate or show its success as fast and so kind of balancing maybe let's say internal politics of people wanting results faster might be a little trickier to say we're going to hit these numbers in a year through content that's probably not going to be the big sell you kind of want to prove other hypotheses and then drive back to the ones that you truly believe in maybe depending on how much capacity or <laughs> mental capacity you have to to kind of argue for your points <laughs> mm. what would some of those initial smaller goals be then to avoid the pressure of having to say oh yeah we're going to get this much traffic in month one how yeah what sort of ones do you say you're going to do in the first few months to appease those pressures? Yeah. I mean, I think we focused a lot more on qualitative feedback. Mm -hmm. um, we have such a small audience. Our domain authority is quite small. And for me, I love, you know, Google and search as a, as a distribution engine. And so you can try and see to find some small wins, whether it's through social media or like communities, I would say, and see what's resonating and what's not. And then you know, if you have some kind of customer advisory board, just even throwing out some of your ideas to see, is there an initial, is there initial, like good qualitative feedback or a response, and then kind of testing it out and then evolving into the right distribution channels. So for me, when I started, I think it, some of the goals are as simple as let's create a few concepts that work or that people are excited about and actually want to read or not, maybe not read, but ingest but also maybe let's figure out what's what like two or three good distribution channels are for us and maybe narrow it down to one ideally because if you're just a team of one you're not going to do a whole bunch of things well so try to like find that one thing that you might be able to do really well yeah yeah nice great great starting point for people starting out but if anyone has any questions uh, just pop them into the chat or the q a box as we go but i'll have go for a pre-submitted one here from Georgia for you, Araminta. How do you ensure stakeholders understand the value of brand awareness campaigns? So, okay, how does this relate to content? So it's like content that's specific for brand awareness, you mean? I reckon it's more, which I guess is a bit you don't focus on as much. I'm imagining it's like top of the funnel yeah, yeah, content, yeah. which is not as easy to track as bottom of the funnel ones. Yeah, I mean... That, that's why we do bottom of the funnel. <laughs> yeah. Because it's just easier to make I a can, I can answer that one. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'll answer. yeah go on. Come. So there's there's one specific brand awareness campaign, in fact, there's only one I've ever run, I guess, with this sole intention of brand awareness. And that was when we created an influencer infographic. First year, it had 50 people in. It done so well the second time. It done so well. So that the second time, we made it 100 and then I turned it into a podcast because I had a hundred people on there and I wanted them all to be guests on my podcast. I then infiltrated them all and tried to get them all to be my customers. That was about brand awareness of one, Mio, my client, 
people now know about them because we've featured them in something that looked really cool and they wanted to share their audience then know about me maybe a little bit as a personal brand exercise it got me on the radar of all those hundred people that I featured and it, it worked so well that people then asked for the version the next year which I hadn't planned on creating but I kind of became the guy that was going to create it so people were dming me saying where is it how do I get on it how do I need to be a Mio partner to be on it? Things like that. So that worked really well in terms of purely intangible benefits like brand awareness. People know me, people know Mio. I then made a Microsoft Teams specific version on my personal website with the same goal. Get on these 50 people's radar, get some money out of them, right? They become paying customers eventually. So there are tangible benefits like that, but there are also big intangible benefits like People know your brand, right? So how do you communicate that to stakeholders? That's the hard part. But I think if you use other people's examples, I'm happy to share mine. Or if you've got one that is, if you find one that is specific to your industry, it's going to be more believable, right? If you can say that my B2B whatever did a brand awareness campaign and now everybody knows about them, you show that to your CMO or whoever, and they say, great, here's the money, go do it. If you say, here's Dave's Cakes, and actually you're a B2B SaaS company, they don't care, they, they wonder what you're doing. So go find a, a good case study relevant to your niche and say, look, it worked for them, why can't it work for us? Here's the plan. Go from there. Yeah, yeah great tip there. They, everyone loves a similar competitor story. Okay, let's jump into another one. Which content metrics do you think? Oh, and thanks, Don, for sharing that in the chat. He's just uh, so I, I I just just remembered that I had something saved ready. It was it's how how to discern tangible and intangible assets in brand awareness. Something that I wrote uh, read about three years ago and just had it saved, and I was like, I'll bring that up. Oh, perfect. Thank you. I'll share that afterwards in the, the emails or if anyone misses that. Okay, what was the question I was going to ask there? Okay, one for you, Hibba. Which content metrics are most important to measure? Yeah, I think at the end of the day, revenue feels like the one that makes the most sense to say, but it really just depends on what the organization's goals are. So right now for us, it doesn't make sense at Testbox to really focus on revenue and revenue only. We're in a process of creating a category. And so I think the bigger goal at that point is we need to educate the market, drive brand awareness, and just let people know who we are and, and help them understand what we do. And so that's maybe more of an edge case. Like at my past companies, revenue is the end all be all. I guess brand affinity could kind of be a secondary goal there. So yeah, I think the really bad answer is it depends. And <laughs> the maybe... Other answer is revenue because again, it helps the business stay afloat. That helps you prove your job out. That helps you get promotions. And it also takes content from this potentially fluffy concept that everyone's like, you're just writing words or you're just creating videos or you're a TikTok influencer, or all this crap. No, you're like, no, I'm actually driving business results. And so I think that that's why I lean more towards the revenue piece. Is it always easy to kind of map everything out? I really think it depends on how the team is structured and how the organization is structured. At past companies, it's been really hard, but at HyperContext, we were able to map revenue down to the actual content piece, which felt really cool, mm -hmm. but can't, can't necessarily say I'm doing that now at Testbox yet. Yeah. Takes a while to get all those things like mapped out and yeah, yeah time's a big factor. Do you use well, it's a question for whoever is using Google Analytics Lock that we've got here from Justin. What's your preferred method within Google Analytics for showing that a piece of content has contributed to conversions? Is it using assisted conversions within GA? Anyone want to tackle that one? I can give a quick answer. Yeah. For GA3, well, actually for both, to be honest. Well, for GA3, use a model comparison tool. I don't know if anyone else uses it. But if you go to conversions and then click on that and then click on multi-channel funnels and then go all the way down to model comparison tool, that's a really nice and easy way to see that. For GA4, you basically have to set up an event and then you have to make sure that that event is, a, you have to tag it as a conversion. And then it's, it's actually, GA4 is a lot more advanced. It's a lot better for that. You can then go to the reports and see it alongside 
your content. So I would say they also have a model comparison tool in, in GA4, uh, but I mean, I guess you could use both events, but events is primary, primarily the best way I would, well, the way that we do it anyway. Oh, I would agree. I was going to actually, shall I share one right now? Yeah, I, happen to, I happen to have it open. Okay. So this is the sole event that I'm tracking in this particular. It's the only GA4 account I've got set up for mm -hmm. one client. So there's literally, we've configured this event as when people go from the blog to the main website. So they're on different subdomains. It's dispatch.m.io and then m.io houses, m.io slash zoom, m.io slash pricing, et cetera, et cetera. So anytime anyone clicks from there to there, it becomes a event or a conversion. What we haven't set up is revenue because it's kind of irrelevant in this yeah. in this case. Every customer could be worth something different. It might be a $1,000 a month customer. It could be a million dollar a month customer. So their movement from the blog to the homepage is irrelevant, really. that They haven't bought anything. It's not revenue-based. It's an event. Just a question for you. Do, do you use Tag Manager to track the the click that like do you use that time manager to set up the event or how yes. do you yeah, yeah okay cool yeah. time manager is great thank you thanks for the live walkthrough there as well don very useful a okay, question from jude she's curious how this how does content measuring work for a service-based business versus a product-based business how can content effectively sell your services I think Araminta should ask this, answer this one because she sells a service. Araminta. Yeah, it's a tough one, honestly. We're just going through this ourselves. I think it all comes down to have you and can you acquire customers cold? Meaning, have you acquired customers with not via word of mouth, basically? Or have you acquired customers without them knowing about your brand before? And it's actually, we're going through this ourselves. And it's interesting because, yes, we do get leads for people who want to work with us called, but very rarely are they a good fit because they, you know, sometimes they haven't even gone through our website much. They're just like, we need a content agency. Let's talk. And I'm like, well, actually we don't do this kind of content. Well, actually you're not a good fit. So it usually doesn't work out. And we're finding that the, the people who work with us the best or who are a, a good fit are people who trust us and know us, maybe met us in person, maybe has have been following our work for a long time. The sales cycle is a lot longer. So it's it's really it's really tough question that I'm still trying to answer myself, and I think it ultimately depends on your what you're set. Even the service is it very high touch, or is it low touch? Is it very self serve, or is it like is the sales team involved and, and all that? So if it's very self serve, then what, what was the question again? Is it can you is it what metrics uh, you have to measure? Right? How can content effectively sell your services? Yeah, it, it definitely can sell services, but I think it's super important to be high touch as well as in go to events, host events, build relationships. So I think services-based companies are much more about building relationships and content alone might not be enough. Unfortunately, I wish it was, but you have to do a lot more. It's so much more work. I don't know if anyone else has been through that, but services-based company, yeah, you have to be like everywhere all the time, basically. <laughs> I think there's, there's maybe a little element of when you're so you, you you and i we both create blogs for our own site right um so if i'm going to spend two days a month writing a blog post for my own site and not doing any billable work and maybe i hire a graphic designer as well that's that's an investment on my part right because I'm, I'm not making any money i'm investing my time into my own business is that thousand pounds that i've set aside by not earning going to reflect an ROI at some point. So am I going to make 10,000 pounds back off this thousand pounds that I've invested? While it's, it's all, I guess it's theoretical at this point, isn't it? Because of everything you just said about it, not you're not going to convince somebody cold to work with you. And if they are, they're probably not going to be the right person. But while you're creating that content at that, at that phase, you should be asking yourself, am I going to get any money back on this investment or should I just do some billable work for these two days instead of working on this blog post that's not going to attract anybody that's that's how I approach the yeah. content I create for my website is it going to one day lead to some money and that one day might be 18 months 36 months or it could just be actually that's the one that would tip a certain person over the edge and think right 
got to hire you now? I think it just serves a different purpose, content in a service-based company, where for a product, it can acquire customers with, with a services-based company is to build trust. So I would never stop publishing content on our website. And uh, when you ask the value, it's more intangible, but I know instinctively that, that it's priceless essentially, because when people read our, our content and maybe the newsletter and LinkedIn, but like, it's not just right, blog content, they read it, they believe it, they like it. And then when we get on the sales call, I don't have to sell anything, right? They're just like, oh, we want to implement this. You know, can you do it? Or can you help us do it? And we're just like, yeah, that's, that's what we do. So great. So it's definitely very valuable. It's just, I think it just serves a little bit of a different purpose than a product-based company, but yeah, there's a lot of variables in there, I would say. Mm. Yeah. Really, really good points there. It's just that, that lag process and slowly, slowly building all that trust can be hard to make time. Yeah. Okay. Question that print, think Hibber, I'm going to put this one to you because you're working in-house. How do you think sales and marketing can work closer together? Probably not the best. Can I haven't worked with a sales team for ah, almost four okay. years, but I think that being said, we've, I've worked a lot with customer success, which is kind of maybe a hybrid, let's say between mm-hmm. sales and, and support. I think they are really great to have at your disposal. I think speaking from my experience at Hyper Context, we got to a point where we truly knew a really solid amount about our customers and the, you know, not only the things that they struggled with, but the topics they were interested in, the formats and what would just be helpful. And it helped us over time create content that, you know, people actually responded back in emails to that were, you know, just to everyone with like positive sentiment. And so I think a lot of that feedback came from us being able to have, you know, obviously one-on-one time from marketing with customers or prospects or ICPs who aren't customers. But I think it gets supercharged when you have people who are much more customer facing than you getting that feedback and understanding, you know, more problems and even more reasons why, let's say people don't pick your product. Um, I think that goes a really long way beyond just, you know, the product roadmap or how you're going to evolve your company. And so while in some cases, maybe there's a love-hate relationship that a lot of people face, I think for me, it's just maybe setting boundaries to say, I am not your pitch deck person, which has been my experience at companies prior, but I think they're a really invaluable resource. And I think it's really important to have solid relationships with at least a few people on the sales team because they're going to help you pr- get like propel your efforts forward so much faster because then you get like my last CEO all he said every single week to the point where I was like I get it stop saying it but I also like say it now because it's stuck in my head is the closest to the customer in any industry will always win and that and so I truly believe that because then you go from just like you know producing a lot of maybe fluff or like noise to actually things that people find valuable, that people will share, that people will potentially take an action on. And whether that action is just sharing it or actually becoming a paid customer or an evangelist, it, it yeah. So that's a, a nice long tangent there. <laughs> yeah, no, really strong point. Like you, the customer service team and sales have absolute gold dust, golden sacred information because of how close they are to the customer. And um, so that's, Yeah, great examples of working well together. Justin has a really good question here. He's asking, do you have any recommendations about how to carry out reporting on content performance? Do you generally do it on a monthly basis? How do you like to format your reporting? What do you usually include? I'll go to you, Dom. I do do weekly for myself Mm -hmm. and customers care about monthly, really, because weekly... I guess is just responding to it's reactive. If, if something major has changed, I'll see it. So I want to know, like last week there was a 25% drop in traffic and conversions. Do I panic or actually was it a bank holiday and that was expected? Right. So I just go in, check it's fine. That's it. I might post it on Slack in the marketing channel. That's about it just because people are interested or if we've launched something that week and I was expecting a big bang has it actually happened right go in and check that I might then check that specific piece of content did it have the impact we were expecting on a monthly basis what the what I want to know as the person tasked with 
making this consistently continuously improve is is the is the traffic converting into what we need it to be and is the traffic still there and is it growing so the tra traffic might be top of the funnel and moving people into lower funnel stages or it might be bottom of the funnel and purely focused on conversion and real pain points but i think what all ceos want is are we making money so traffic filtered down into conversions filtered down into revenue it's probably the the three stages that everybody wants to see traffic people i think marketers say that traffic is a vanity metric but if there is traffic there's an opportunity right so if people are coming to your blog they're going to do something it might be leave but there's an opportunity to turn that leave into stay and pay for your product yeah absolutely and do you, how, how do you present your weekly or monthly reports? We keep it very simple, monthly. And I think it's just organic traffic to the blog, mm -hmm. leads generated from the blog, and then a breakdown for each one. So number of like traffic per blog post, leads per blog post, and then rankings, just because it's interesting to see if things are going up or down. So we, we track certain keywords. You can do that on SEMrush. And you can see where they're where they're moving every week. Initially, that's the three things. Don't need to overcomplicate it. What do you do for leads per blog? What tool do you use? Or do you do it manually? Well, Google Analytics. Or we just looked at Google Analytics or HubSpot or uh, yeah, Google Analytics model comparison tool. It breaks it down per 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 blog post, and HubSpot does that as well. Nice, nice, simple three metrics there. And Hiba? Yeah, I did weekly as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I was going to say too, around the, the traffic being a vanity metric piece, I think the other thing that was quite interesting for us was being able to see the quality of the traffic. And I'm and not just talking about like bounce rate, for example, but actually seeing of the traffic you drove that week, what was the conversion rate? Because I think that was a way for us to kind of push back when the CEO would have the common inclination of, I want to hit a thousand, like a hundred thousand visitors a month. And it's like, we can hit that, but yeah. do you want them to be good visitors or bad visitors? And so I think that pushback always helped keep the marketing team really focused on, you know, org wide goals and traffic could be a part of that just as long as you have the quality metric to kind of support it, um, in my opinion. But I think the, the other piece around weekly was we had a quarter where we just dedicated all of our content efforts to updates. And so weekly really helped us look at, okay, did we shit the bed or did we actually do a good job? And at that point, it would even be daily after the piece wow. was just like, mm -hmm. what is like, and that was more just curiosity rather than reporting to the team to say, okay, first day, is there a good sign or is there a bad sign? Do we revert it or do we keep it? And so I think we got a, a good check. I think we got a good rhythm at least that it was always kind of going up, which was a nice feeling. But I think when had things gone wrong, kind of being able to see things as they happen within that week rather than a month later, I think makes sure that you don't lose three weeks, let's say, of progress. Um, and so as a company at, at Hyper Context, we looked at our goals across the board every single week. That way, you know, similar to what Dom was saying, if there's a big holiday, we knew it was coming. No one was panicking. But how do we fix not fix it the next week? But if it was not a bank holiday and something went bad, we can quickly revert across the product, across marketing efforts, across success, whatever team kind of was the bigger driver in numbers either going up or down. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yes. And good way to iterate quickly if you need to. Yeah. So I'm just conscious that we're at time, but there's one final question that I'll try and squeeze in, if that's okay, from Caitlin, who is asking, if you're a first marketing hire or a freelancer, how do you ease the expectations that you can do it all? Is there a specific type of content you should focus on, i.e. landing pages, blogs, etc.? Enter. I would have thought that would be a question for Huba, because we, I have never been a first marketing hire, and I'm very specialist, so... I'll, I'll pass it on to Hiba. Growing up to you, back to you, Hiba. I'll preface this with I'm not good at this necessarily, but I think advice that I've gotten lately was there's obviously a lot that can happen. Everything, fe everything feels like a number one priority to everyone on the team. And that doesn't make sense because you can only have one number one priority, not 10. And so something you can do is actually just list out everything that's on your plate and say, hey, here's the big snapshot of what's going on. 
here's what I think I should do. And here's what I can realistically do in the time frame. Like, what do you think? And it kind of throws the ball back into whoever, let's say it's com- in some capacity, if it's out of your control to say, here's the list. What is your absolutely your number one priority? And I think that helps take the pressure off both in like having multiple people have expectations on you and just really sharing context into what's going on and what's realistic. And it also, if you're like me and you cannot always say no all the time, then I think that's an like a nice barrier for you to, to be able to say no just a, a bit more often at least. That's an excellent tip. Oh, I love that idea of just showing them the full context so they can understand. Yeah, I like that. Uh- Another one, a word that I like to use would be like deprioritize. So if someone's like, can you do this? You can be like, yeah, sure. What should I deprioritize then? Mm. Yeah. Just like showing them the opportunity costs, essentially. Have you guys read Do One Thing? Yeah. Very good book. Yeah. Nope. Everything that Hibber was saying is kind of the mantra of Do One Thing, isn't it? The front cover says, and I don't know this off by heart, I just Google it. The front cover says the breakthrough you need for the progress you want, which it was a bit fluffy, but it kind of makes sense. When I, I read it to see if I wasn't working that way, and it turns out I was, and it kind of just validated that I'm, I'm doing this right to prioritize what I need to get done rather than to appease other people. The question was, like Araminta said, I can do this, yes, but I can't do all of it at the same time. So what do I deprioritize? And the book does a very good job of explaining that. Yeah, good, good recommendation there. Thank you, Dom. And thank you to three of you for your time this afternoon. Really brilliant chat. Lots of good tips there. So thank you so much. Thanks for having us. This was fun. Yeah, my pleasure. We'll do it again sometime. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. For having us. Love to have you back. Bye. Thanks everyone for joining. Bye-bye. Bye.